Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our lunch. In honor of the Fulbright program, which, as most of you know, dates back to 1946, set up just after a terrible, terrible war where lots of nations spent lots of time and money killing each other. And one senator, J. William Fulbright, had the idea, well, why don't we try and have people understand each other and maybe we can avoid such a horrible fight again. Um, as President Truman, I think, said at one point, if we don't want to kill each other in war, we've got to learn to understand each other in peace. So the Fulbright program, as you know, has, been, has had over 300,000 alums since then. Um, the overarching vision is to help mutual understanding around the world. And I mention that because it's quite similar to my organization. I run the Los Angeles World Affairs Council, which was actually founded in this club in 1953 with a similar aim to help people understand the outside world. Um, they met in a, a room not too far from here. And interestingly, one of the founders, Preston Hotchkiss, his son is here, Mr. John Hotchkiss, who's our current chairman. Um, we're on a pretty tight schedule today because uh, even Ryan, whom I'm about to introduce, has to make a plane. So let me go straight to introduction there and, and then we'll introduce some, some other speakers later on. Um, but even Ryan is the Assistant Secretary of State for Education and Cultural Affairs. And as you probably know, it's the State Department's budget that covers the Fulbright program. Uh, she assumed this job um, in September of this year, um, fresh to the job. Um, and she oversees not just Fulbrights, but a wide range of academic and cultural and sporting exchanges um, with, I think, over 160 countries around the world. Um, before she did this job, uh, from 2009, um, Ms. Ryan served in the White House as the assistant to the vice president and special assistant to the president on intergovernmental affairs and public engagement. Um, before that, she was deputy campaign manager for the Biden for, president, for vice president campaign. Um, Ms. Ryan previously served in the White House from 1994 to 2000, uh, where she was deputy director of scheduling for first lady Hillary Clinton, and she was also special assistant to the first lady's chief of staff. Um, she's a Virginia native, holds a BA from Boston College, and an MIPP from the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International St Studies. I give you even Ryan. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be with you. Thank you, Terry, uh, for the kind introduction and for having me here today. I'd also like to thank Tom Healy, the chairman of the Fulbright Board, and Laura Trombley for uh, having us and hosting the Fulbright Board and having us here too. As Terry said, I did in September uh, join the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the US Department of State. So we, we refer to it as ECA, um, but by that count, I'm really just in my seventh week of the job. So this is very new. And as I mentioned yesterday to uh, a few people, it's the first, California and this trip is the, my first trip away from the State Department. So I'm very honored to be with you all today and I'm, the trip is very memorable for me. And uh, the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, ECA as I'll refer to it, oversees our public engagement with the world. And our monumental mission is to increase mutual understanding between the people of the United States and people of other countries. We fund and manage, as Terry mentioned, hundreds of academic, professional, cultural exchange programs. And through these programs, we connect with emerging leaders, students, professionals, researchers, artists, athletes um, from all over the world. And we connect these people to the United States. Last week was a big week for ECA as well. I participated in my first International Education Week and the unveiling of the Open Doors Report. The Open Doors Report showcases how many people are studying in the US and also how many Americans are studying abroad. So we were delighted to see increases in the number of foreign students studying in the US as well as an increase in the number of American students studying abroad. Of the 820,000 international students in the U.S., all together with those students studying from abroad in the U.S., total they contribute $24 billion to the U.S. economy. 
And of those, 110,000 students are in California, the most of any state, and they contribute over 3.5 billion to the California economy. In fact, the University of Southern California, just down the street, is the US institution that hosts the largest number of international students. ECA's programs include the Fulbright programs, which is the US government's flagship international exchange program. Beyond its prestigious reputation, Fulbright program participants are known for their excellence in scholarship and leadership. And California, with its strong public and private university systems and its innovative industries, such as Hollywood and Silicon Valley, remains a top sender and a top receiver of Fulbrighters. The reason for this, I, I have one of the reasons for this is, is sitting right in front of us here, and that's Pitzer College, whose president, Laura Trombley, is one of our hosts today, and for the fourth consecutive year, is the top producer of Phil, Fulbright students among all US colleges in the bachelor's institution category, which is really amazing and really a tribute to Laura. After Pitzer, <laughs> Berkeley, Humboldt State, Stanford, and Pomona are also top producing schools. Our exchange initiatives form lasting personal relationships for participants and also with those that they interact with here in the US or, or people that our students interact with overseas. These experiences break down barriers and create global partnerships. By sending Americans abroad and bringing citizens of other countries to the United States, we sustain and advance a more just, secure, and prosperous world. So a bit about the history of the Fulbright program. In the aftermath of the World War II, Senator Fulbright believed that one of the best ways to help prevent further conflict and to build world peace was to enable people to interact with one another through educational exchange. Senator Fulbright, for sure, was a pragmatist. He did not expect that interpersonal interaction would necessarily result in people always agreeing with one another or immediately solving every world problem. But he reasoned that such interaction on an individual basis would affect people's thinking and perceptions about one another in the long term. Over 60 years and more than 325,000 Fulbrighters later, I think we can say he was right. The Fulbright program, which currently operates in more than 150 countries worldwide, is a partnership. A partnership between governments, as well as with US nonprofit organizations that help administer 8,000 Fulbright grants annually. And it's also a partnership with universities, corporations, foundations, and citizens that provide direct and indirect support. Since its inception in 1946, the program has maintained strong bipartisan support from Congress, which provides the primary source of funding through the annual appropriation to the State Department. Both President Obama, who was deeply affected by his own time living overseas, and Secretary of State Kerry, whose daughter was a Fulbright student in the UK, understand the importance of international exchange programs in sustaining and advancing our foreign policy and also our national security. I also studied abroad. I carry my experiences with me every day. And I understand the impact that these exchanges can have on one's life and one's career and the options that, that, that one chooses to take down the road as a result of that experience. But beyond my own experience, let me provide a few other specific examples of how the Fulbright program supports our nation's foreign policy goals. The Fulbright program remains one of the world's leading programs of international study. In the 21st century, Fulbrighters addressed critical priorities while building relationships, knowledge, and leadership that benefit the United States and that also benefit the world. The program has given opportunities to distinguished scholars and leaders to address the major global challenges of our time, climate change, public health, sustainable energy, and many more. It supports study and teaching in all fields, as well as creative work in the arts. The Fulbright program stands as one of the most sought after and highly leveraged foreign affairs programs of the United States government. 
And the Fulbright program adapts over time. For more than 60 years, the Fulbright program has been agile and innovative in fostering mutual understanding and people-to-people -people connections. We provide enrichment workshops for foreign Fulbrighters that tap US academic and private sector expertise in science and technology fields, including lab to market innovation, our Fulbright Nexus program for early career scholars from the United States and the Western Hemisphere has supported collaborative, multidisciplinary re research with direct application to problems. Fulbright is a resource for US engagement with frontline states and transitioning democracies. Fulbright is helping countries like Afghanistan, Iraq, and Pakistan build capacity within academic institutions, government ministries, and civil society. After long hiatuses, Fulbright programs have recently been reopened in Libya and in Burma. And we are working on sending the first Fulbright specialist to consult on educational issues in the new country of South Sudan this winter. Fulbright builds on capacity in developing countries through programs like the J. William Fulbright Hillary Rodham Clinton Public Policy Fellowship. This program places young American professionals in foreign government ministries where they gain hands-on public sector experience and contribute to important policy goals. Fulbright Clinton Fellows are currently assigned to Burma, the Cote d'Ivoire, Ethiopia, Guatemala, Haiti, Malawi, Nepal, and Samoa. Fulbright responds to the worldwide demand for English. English has become the international language of business, science, technology, and media, and foreign governments are eager to increase their citizens' English language fluency as a vehicle for opportunity. Fulbright supports those efforts through programs such as our Fulbright English Teaching Assistant Program. Operating in 70 countries, this program annually places 900 recent US college graduates in English teaching classrooms abroad. The majority of these people are placed in underserved schools and underserved regions. Fulbright advances the global science agenda with more than 1,600 Fulbrighters focusing on science-related research and teaching each and every year. Fulbright also represents the full diversity of the United States whether institutional, field of study, geographic, gender, or racial ethnic diversity, the Fulbright program reflects it. Fulbright outreach and recruitment efforts target underserved communities, rural areas, minority serving institutions, and community colleges to ensure that all applicants have equal access to this merit-based program. Special efforts and funding are also made to offer opportunities that are inclusive for people with all types of disabilities. Even in my short time leading the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, I have already noticed a trend when it comes to Fulbright alumni. The program clearly pays dividends over the course of a lifetime. Fulbright alumni have gone on to achieve distinction in government, in science, the arts, business, philanthropy, and education. Among the ranks of Fulbright alumni are 45 Nobel Prize recipients, that's quite a number, 28 MacArthur Foundation Fellows, 80 Pulitzer Prize winners, and 29 current or former heads of state or government. It's really an amazing number. One of this year's Nobel Prize winners, UK physicist Peter Higgs, was a Fulbright scholar at the University of North Carolina. So I'd like to close today by thanking all of you for your engagement on, on world issues. All of you here I know are deeply engaged and interested in the work that we are all doing. And I wanna thank you also for your contributions to increasing understanding between the United States and countries all across the globe. Some of you may have hosted international students or visitors at your organizations or your homes. Some of you may have traveled overseas on academic and professional exchanges yourselves. My hope is that regardless, you encourage students and young people that you meet to explore this option. I think it's more and more important in the world that we live in today. As our economy becomes increasingly globalized and technology continues to shrink the distances between us, it's essential that Americans be even more engaged with the world around us. And international exchanges, in my view, are the best tool to do that. So we have to do this, and I would love for, to have your help. 
Thank you again for having me. Enjoy your lunch. And this is so lovely. I wish I could say I'm so sorry I have to go to the airport. Thank you all so much. So unfortunately, um, even has to rush to the airport for matters of state, which is what you do in your Department of State, I guess. Let me just uh, outline what we're going to do today, um, the rest of the program. Um, Tom Healy, who's chairman of the Fulbright um, Board, will come up and talk. And then uh, Laura, Pitzer will, uh, Laura Tremblay will talk about Pitzer. I'm sorry. Um, slip my tongue. And then we're going to have a panel discussion here. We'll have uh, uh, three people sitting up here, um, including Paul Kim, who's a a Fulbright alum himself, and we'll be soliciting questions from the floor. But let me first int introduce Tom Healy, who's chairman of the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board, which oversees the Fulbright program worldwide. Um, Tom was appointed to the board by President Barack Obama in 2011. Um, he's a writer and a poet, and he also teaches at New York University and I think is a, a visiting professor at the uh, New School. Um, he's the author of two books, Animal Spirits and What the Right Hand Knows. He served on President Clinton's Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS, um, and he worked on AIDS prevention anti-poverty projects around the world. He served as president of the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council in the years after 9-11. It was challenging times. And he was awarded the New York City Arts Award by Mayor Michael Bloomberg in 2005 for leading rebuilding efforts for the downtown arts community. He studied philosophy at Harvard and received his MFA in creative writing from Columbia. Ladies and gentlemen, Tom Healy. So Laura Trombley, the president of Pitzer, told me why we all look so good in this room with the lighting. And that's because this used to be the women's floor of the California club. Uh, when, when the club was separated for women and men, and they deliberately made the lighting cast us in a great glow. <laughs> and Laura and her team at Pitzer cast the entire Fulbright program in a great glow. Uh, they at Pitzer have gotten essential what uh, was being described earlier as the mission of this program and the desire that Senator Fulbright had for taking a time of the end of war and its uncertainty and building peace. You know, it's, uh, today is the 100th, 150th anniversary of another speech and people are gathered in rooms like this and on battlefields all over the world, and certainly at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, where those just more than 250 words were delivered by President Lincoln at a time when it looked as though finally the war was going to turn and he could imagine the possibility of healing and bringing together an America. That idea of healing and bringing peace obviously was so powerfully on Senator Fulbright's mind, and on, uh, it's on our mind every day. I spent some time in the Middle East, as a number of the people here have, and I was there just after the revolution began, and the idea of speaking and, and what one did and the words one found for peace, like the Gettysburg Address, was prominent. So urgent in Egypt. And a joke was going around at the time about uh, President Mubarak, and one of his generals said to him, Mr. President, uh, there's a clamor in the streets, and, and you're really going to have to go address the people and give a farewell address. He said, really, why? Where are the people going? I remember the California Club so strongly because I was first introduced here, 1986, by Kevin Starr, who is the historian of California, extraordinary man. 
And I showed up at the door and wasn't allowed in because I didn't have a jacket and tie. And I thought I left those at the Mississippi River. And so it was in this building that I learned how to tie a bow tie. As Kevin Starr, for those of you who knew him, he was always with a bow tie and he had an extra one in his pocket. They found a jacket from uh, the closet and he tied a bow tie on me. And he told me, taught me so much about the history of this great state, the history of America and its connection obviously to the rest of the world and how many people came here, that world. You know, Pitzer, where I just visited with our Fulbright board for the first time this week, is uh, built on the old orange groves of the Pitzer estate. And it's interesting to think of the history of the orange and how it got here. It's actually reached the Americas in 1513. That was 600 years ago this year. And you could kind of trace a effort around the globe as Portuguese and other, and then Spanish traders would bring the orange seeds and plants through them and they brought it to the United States and eventually we had the prosperity of the orange and white of Pitzer College. Uh, it's a thrill to, to be here with all of you. It's a thrill to be one of 12 colleagues on the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board and if I may, uh, just ask them all to rise so we could, could meet the other people who I am only one among equals on this uh, extraordinary board. And so let's... <laughs> so, uh, Kevin... Uh, used to love to tell jokes, and he liked to tell geography jokes. And this is our first time meeting in Southern California in I don't know how long. We met in Northern California in the early part of uh, the 2000s, so we thank Laura for bringing us here to Southern California. But I remember that um, Kevin used to say, well, he knew a geography teacher and was always uh, asked to share their students' knowledge. And she said, well, here's what I was told on some exams. Uh, that Don Juan is a town in the West Indies. The general direction to the Alps is straight up. And to reach America, cross the Hudson River. And that much is true. I crossed the Hudson River to come here, and uh, we have reached America, and it's in this room, and we're thrilled to be here, and I'd like to ask our host, Laura Trombley, to say a few words. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's wonderful to see you here, both new friends as well as returning friends to Pitzer College and the World Affairs Council. Today I see our luncheon the perfect culmination of time, place, and purpose. Pitzer College, the Fulbright Program, and the Los Angeles World Affairs Council are all visionary and they are pioneering and we've had a long history together. As Pitzer celebrates its 50th anniversary this year, and you are all now part of our history, we proudly graduate the highest number of Fulbright fellows in the nation. And in fact, we had Fulbright scholars at our very founding. The college's first president, John Atherton, held four. Uh, he had Fulbrights for Japan, Malta, England, and Egypt. When Senator Fulbright actually spoke at the California Club in the late 60s as chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, he described foreign policy as the summation of all the nation's policies, defense, economic, agricultural, and above all, educational. He believed that education makes us all travelers and that to truly achieve mutual understanding in the world, we must experience it firsthand and in depth. 
Pitzer shares Senator Fulbright's faith in the power of human-to-human -human interaction. And our commitment to the Fulbright program stems from our belief that what draws students into the classroom, the deep desire to learn, should also be what propels them out of it. The desire to cross borders to meet people and gain new perspectives. Study abroad has always been part of Pitzer's <clears throat> academic fabric. And in the fall of 1964, when we welcomed our first class, this very small group of women, we were a women's college in those days, included students from Guatemala, Japan, Panama, Sweden, and Uganda. By 1965, Emerita alumna trustee Deborah Deutsch Smith was our first student to study abroad in that exotic country, Italy. And in those days, our study abroad program consisted of her being given a round trip ticket and being told to learn. <laughs> By 1974, the college had established its own study abroad program in Nepal, and this year we also celebrate 40 years of an absolutely exceptional program that has been transformational in our students' lives. Today, nearly 80% of our students study abroad, one of the highest percentages in the country, through one of Pitzer's programs or exchange programs in 34 countries. Since our founding, we have graduated 176 Fulbright Fellows, held over a dozen Fulbright Scholars among our faculty and administrators, and last summer we received a Fulbright Hayes uh, scholarship that allowed area middle school and high school teachers to travel with <coughs> our faculty and students to Nepal for a five-week stay. The purpose was to start understanding how our countries are connected and to introduce the curriculum and content into their courses in the Ontario area. We at Pitzer learn about the world with a non-traditional lens and our communitarian spirit embodies the Pitzer Fulbright connection and we have been led in developing and strengthening this connection by Professor Nigel Boyle, who is the director of our Global Local Center, and he is the guiding force for all of our Fulbright scholars. And I'd like to ask Ful uh, <laughs> Nigel to just rise and be recognized. <laughs> when Senator Fulbright spoke to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council 53 years ago, he described the moment in time as an era of unprecedented change and upheaval. Well, I'm glad we're past that. In our own era of unprecedented change, I hope you feel as I do that the Fulbright program has contributed enormously to strengthen our relations with the rest of the world. Sometimes one person, one project at a time, sometimes with fundamental policy shifts that make us reimagine the map, giving us reasons to be optimistic about our future. We decided at Pitzer that we wanted to put this optimism to film, and we're debuting a film that was produced by our Office of Communications, led by Vice President Mark Bailey. And in this film, we have asked some of our Fulbright alumni to describe how their Fulbright experience transformed their lives and changed their ideas about how to best live as individuals as well as members of a global community. And so, please enjoy, and here is the debut of our Fulbright tribute. Thank you. I have seen multitudes now at Pitzer College of our students graduating with a Fulbright Fellowship, and they all come back and tell me just what an extraordinary experience this has been for them. I think Pitzer's study abroad programs really help forge great Fulbrighters. Our programs challenge students. They're difficult, they're hard. Uh, they encounter problems that they have to overcome, challenges that they need to address. And I think it's those kinds of experiences which tend to make students great Fulbrighters in the field. A lot of people come back from Pitzer study abroad programs enlightened and inspired and ready to take action and 
move into the rest of the world and see what they can accomplish. But I think the experience of being a Fulbrighter abroad is really transformative and I've seen that in our students that have been abroad on Fulbrights, uh, that their career choices, their uh, interests, their ideas are, are, are really thoroughly transformed by the experience. One of the distinctive strengths of the Fulbright is just interpersonal and intercultural understanding, which I think is vital for any career path that people might pursue. It really helps U.S. relations internationally to help improve those relations, that we're not all just here to create war or what they see on TV, but that we're, he we're here for an exchange, an educational exchange. Their idea of American is, you know, blue eyes, blonde hair. I guess I sort of broke that <laughs> stereotype. The Fulbright program has students of every kind of socioeconomic background. They start understanding that, you know, America is more, you know, it's not just what they see on TV and Hollywood film is actually much more diverse. There's no substitute for people from different cultures, from different backgrounds, different languages, meeting each other and people being put into wholly new circumstances where they get to help people in need, teach them a language, learn from them, make the world a little smaller. They come back, they've tasted the food, they've sang the songs, and they can bring that back to their own communities and then help expand the cultural awareness of the people at home as well as the people abroad. You know, the whole idea of soft power may sound kind of cliche, but it's an extension of power that we have that is collaborative. Fulbright is one of the most legitimate mechanisms that we have to do that. The story is the same, the sense that this experience of engaging with people from other cultures means that you've learned something deep and essential about yourself and you've learned that you're part of a greater community and that's how peace and mutual understanding work. I thought I knew, you know, I thought I had an answer. You know, I was the educated one, you know, from coming from the U.S. And I was the one with the degree I was coming and yet yeah, they taught me so much more about life. My hope is that we as a country realize just how important this program is and fully support it. Thank you. So if I could ask Laura and Tom to come up and also Paul Kim, whom you saw in that, uh, in that video. Um, Laura is truly a force of nature. One of the things she didn't mention was that since she became president of Pitzer, she's raised their rankings in the US News and World Report ranking, that ranking that everyone loves to hate, and yet everyone watches it so closely. And she's raised them from uh, 70 to 35, 35 points. Um, so if I confuse her last name with Pitzer, you can see she actually embodies Pitzer. Um, so apart from Laura and, and, um, and Tom, we have one more speaker, um, Paul, whom you saw in that video there. Uh, Paul is from Los Angeles. And he went to serve in the U.S. Navy as a medical corpsman uh, from 2000 to 2005, served in both Iraq and Afghanistan, saw some pretty grisly things over there, as you can imagine. And then he came to Pitzer, um, and he, he studied in Pitzer as a new resources student. And Laura's told me about this. It's a priority at Pitzer where they uh, actively recruit students who are older, over 25, and a, a bunch of them are from, from the military. Uh, veterans and uh, these veterans desperately need to, to get a new start after what they've been through in the war, so that's fantastic. And Paul um, <clears throat> got his degree, uh, graduated in 2011 with an honors degree in inter international intercultural studies, and then he went to Thailand. And I think some of the pictures we saw from there were from Thailand. Um, uh, he developed a keen interest in community based, environmentally sustainable social and economic development, and he's currently working, I think, with a, um, a non profit in Thailand still, right? Yeah. So um, we're going to open up to your questions. I think everyone is mic'd up. Um, who's going to shoot first? Well, I'll break the ice. <laughs> um, I grew up in Ireland, which might be of no surprise to you when you can hear my accent. And I was sent to study in Germany when I was just 14 years old um, for a summer. And it changed my life in a way that's hard to explain. 
And I have since then been a lifelong advocate of overseas exchange programs of all types for every country and anywhere in the world. Um, I'm wondering, Paul, can you talk a little bit, expand a little bit more about what you said on the film about how it changed you to go overseas as a Fulbrighter to, uh, to Thailand? Um, I made that decision because, you know, before my you know, Fulbright uh, program, uh, I've been to countries where they didn't really welcome me. <laughs> so it's, it was a kind of difficult because we were there in, in, in a way to sort of help them, right? To protect them, their freedom and you know, sort of, in, sort of uh, protect our, our you know, idea of democracy. Um, and Fulbright sort of, you know, going in, in, in as a Fulbright scholar was very different. You know, people welcoming, um, they're, more, they're more engaging with uh, with, with what my, my interests are, my purpose of being there at the same time, they're more willing to open up and really share their idea of, of what they want to learn and what they want me to do um, as, a, as, a, as a ETA there. So um, but I, think, I think the best part was that this openness that I felt in that label Fulbright, how they would call it, really opened a lot of doors for me, not only in an academic circle, but just you know, in the community, in the very small community, because um, in Los Angeles, when I talk to my you know, friends or people around me, they don't really understand what Fulbright is all about. They just think it's a, it's a scholarship or a fellowship that you just go and, you know, and like, like any other study abroad program. And however, in, in Thailand, uh, everybody knew why we're there. And, and, and that was really a surprising thing for me that, oh, how come this is an American program? And yet they're more interested in learning who I am because I'm a Fulbright scholar. So I think that. It's interesting what you say because I know as a corpsman you don't carry a weapon, but you would have been to a, 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 some pretty tense situations with guys carrying guns. Yes. And um, then you went back to another country with no body armor and yes. just... Yes, yes. And that's definitely true. I, mean, I, didn't really, I only had a sidearm as a protection and we're not allowed to um, you know, engage in any kind of firefight. <clears throat> and yeah, of course... Not having a uniform on and being in another country, I guess that was the first thing that's almost a <laughs> relief in a way for them <laughs> that we're not there <laughs> to, 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 to as, a, as, a, as a scary person, you know, that's what the children would call it. But, you know, uh, but as, a, as a Fulbright scholar, you know, just going as a, as a person, just you know, going there doing my job and I went and I was really surprised how welcoming they were with him. Mean, that's, that was, you know, I mean, that's, I'm repeating myself again, but that was really an uh, initial reaction was that, wow, they really are taking care of me. Wow, they are really interested, genuinely interested in what I have to say. So that was the difference. What Paul's not telling you is, is last night he told us that people were so welcoming of him that families were offering their daughters to him at uh, dinners every week. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I wonder, has any work been done? I don't know, Laura or, or Tom, if you know this. I, there's a very venerable list of alums, Nobel Prize winners and, and Pulitzer Prize winners and heads of state from, from the Fulbright program, but has any work been done on, on overall how Fulbright scholars do in terms of jobs, careers, and so on, compared to students that don't go overseas like that? Sure, it's, it's interesting. There, we're increasingly getting um, better statistics and things about that. One of the things that's dramatically changed our connection to and knowledge of Fulbright scholars has been the explosion of social media. So the difficulty in gathering people together after their Fulbrights and keeping up with their addresses and commitments has changed so much. And I'll just give one small example of, of how that's happened with me when I was in Egypt. I, I gave some talks on lectures on poetry and revolution and uh, to packed classes, which were not there for me, but for students who were there to really express themselves and find a language for freedom. And I don't speak Arabic, so my knowledge of this uh, curriculum ended really quickly, and, and people wanted to do more, some teachers did. And so they said, how do we do this? I said, well, let's go on Facebook and ask for some Fulbright scholars who speak Arabic and have taught poetry and do this. And within three days, we had eight people who had been Fulbright scholars and taught literature together. And everywhere I go around the world, you see this happening where people now, as Fulbright scholars, can find one another and can share projects. So when I first joined the board, Secretary Clinton was there. 
And she said, Tom, we have this 300,000 uh, alumni in so many countries. If I want to talk about an issue like hunger or food safety or human trafficking, or, I need to be able to find these Fulbright experts. And so we've been making lots of efforts to do that, and Fulbright scholars themselves have. And I think the way that it's working is that it's just not numbers on a page for, for these uh, trends and things, but rather that there's specific purpose for people's engagement, that they come together around projects, and sometimes those are community building, uh, building schools, other efforts like that. And then others are around their field of interest. So, uh, well, the answer is we don't have detailed statistics about that. We're getting them and getting much better. Um, I have a question for you, Laura. Even Ryan, in her talk, mentioned that the number of foreign students coming to the United States is at record highs, over 800,000, and that the number of US students going overseas is also record high, 200 and something thousand. However, if you drill down into that figure, the sad reality is for the American students going overseas, a lot of them are going for a semester or less. Mm -hmm. Some of them in the business schools, they go for like two or three weeks, mm -hmm. which is really just a vacation. Um, Fulbright programs, you don't do two or three week Fulbrights. No. I'm wondering how easy is it for you to sell the concept of a Fulbright program to a student who may think, well, does this mean I lose a year in my job search, or what am I giving up, what am I losing to this? Is it, is it an easy sell, or, or how, do you, how do you sell a Fulbright program to your students? Well, we don't try and sell it, uh, first of all. What we do is we have, I think, incredibly innovative programs of our own that have been well established for many years. And we have many, many exchange programs. And we actually have uh, developed uh, a great budgetary system. So if students are genuinely interested in traveling abroad, as one of our uh, alumni said last night, she was able to go abroad three times to three different countries. And uh, I think what happens is that students understand the depth and the importance of having these uh, immersion opportunities. And so uh, when Nigel meets with students and talks to them about possibilities, um, he's really building on the experiences that they have gained both in our study abroad programs as well as in our curriculum on, on the Pitzer campus. And students are very, very interested in what I think they would consider continuing those experiences. And uh, one of the um, great parts about the Fulbright program is that you have local chapters where Fulbrighters come together and they talk about their experiences and they network and there's also a national Fulbright Association as well so it isn't just one experience that you have bookmark it and put it away it's really intended I think the Fulbright program to last you the rest of your life and uh, we're very interested in trying to maintain those relationships uh, because I do think, based on my conversations with individuals uh, on our campus who have uh, been awarded Fulbrights as well as nationally, um, they do have a very particular perspective. And uh, yes, it's transformational. Yes, they are doing good things in the world, but they also bring an added depth to conversations. And so I think Pitzer students, since of course I think that they're the best students in the country, um, they realize that. And that's one of the um, strongest aspects of what we do at Pitzer College. And I, I forgot to mention, for those of you who may not be as familiar with Pitzer College as some of us, Pitzer is a college of a thousand students. Uh, and so we have what I refer to as the ripple effect. And so our brilliant alumni go and affect many, many, many other individuals because the point of the Pitzer education is not just that it is transformational for yourself, but you have a responsibility to go out and try and create positive change wherever you go. Did you want to like I'd like to address that a little bit too because uh, Pitzer is something we're so proud of and have learned a lot about how it doesn't take just a village here, it takes a whole community and a university that's created an atmosphere for, for this kind of international engagement. But there's something serious, uh, I think, behind your question about the kind of engagement American students have with the kinds of loans that students have and the kind of career expectation and anxiety that exists now. We actually do find 
that there is a real challenge for a number of students to contemplate doing this. And one of the great hallmarks of this program, and I'm just so proud of, of the, this program over this amount of time, but all the people who work for the State Department here, is its commitment to diversity, geographic diversity, socioeconomic diversity, gender, the range of commitments to get people who might not have been the typical ivory tower, Fulbright uh, scholar uh, person. But, so you have people who are first generation college graduates. And you, uh, I was told this actually by the Fulbright director in Nepal where, where Pitzer has a terrific program. She said, you, we have a lot of trouble, she said, getting African Americans and Hispanic Americans to come to Nepal. It's usually Caucasians and somewhat some Asian American students. And I said, so what's the challenge? She said, well, we, we talk to them, they'll say, all right, I'm the first person in my family to go to college or I have these loans. And then I say to my family, I'm getting a Fulbright scholarship. And they say, you're going where to do what? You know, with the expectation for success and career and often helping support a family that uh, depends on your progress for them is something that's critical. So there is an education element. Don't forget we're in a country where when they get to Congress, a majority of members of Congress don't have a passport. So it is not a country where that sense of international engagement is really valued. You are at a time with great anxiety. We take that issue very seriously in cultivating uh, an attitude of engagement and recruitment that does face resistance. Even in the global world we're in, there's a sense that I couldn't afford to do that. It's interesting. I know um, <clears throat> Gary Rhodes, who runs the Overseas Exchange Program at UCLA here, mm -hmm. has um, got some figures on this and shows very interestingly that minority students that go overseas for whatever program, be it Fulbright or something else, when they come back, their career uh, uh, success is enhanced disproportionately. Sure. Um, um, evidently, that's, that's really helping them along. And so the idea of the diversity of the program is, is fantastic. Does anyone else have a question from the floor? Sir, can we get the microphone to you? So everybody, we have a mic here. Thank you. I was wondering um, when American foreign policy changes, um, how that might affect the Fulbright focus. For instance, we have apparently pivoted towards Asia, and I was wondering if Fulbright is pivoting with, uh, with our foreign policy. That's a really interesting question, Bruce. What, what I can say, what I find that's been the success of this program, and I'm perfectly happy to criticize our government, but it has been immune from the politics and particular directions of any administration. What we have seen is that whenever there is a, a time of American military engagement in the world, the commitment to public diplomacy, education, cultural exchange has usually strengthened and gone up. So there, there is that linkage. But there is, and there is a sense in general that we have d uh, put a pressure on our budgetary engagement in Western Europe where there is greater wealth, there's uh, other possibilities of exchange, and we have expanded it through the rest of the world. But it is not a direct thing to say, all right, we're trying to push kids to go to Asia or to somewhere else. It really is that it's a big world, and we want to make sure we provide a wide range of opportunities and open doors where it may be harder than other projects. But I really feel a really terrific independence of the program from any particular administration's uh, political initiatives and choices. A question, question in the back there. Um, I suppose this question is really for Laura. Um, have you been able to pinpoint reasons why Pitzer has been so successful in producing Fulbright scholars? And uh, what sort of preparations do you specifically do for, to make sure they get the most out of the programs and not just the Fulbright programs, but also other study abroad programs. 
Well, I'll speak to part of this, and then I would love for Nigel to add to this, because he's the one who's actually making this work. And um, Pitzer, I think, is a very com communitarian place. And when we embrace the core value of intercultural understanding, this is something that's practiced not just by faculty, but by everyone on campus. And uh, we are very, again, some of the comments that have been made by our uh, alumni Fulbrighters, um, they were talking about how from the moment of entry at Pitzer College, they started to see uh, signage for uh, interest meetings talking about study abroad. Uh, Nigel has done enormous outreach inviting people to come and uh, talk to him about the Fulbright program. So this is something that starts from the moment that students arrive. We have, I think, a very um, global curriculum. We have very few gen eds, so students have to be very proactive in their choices. And faculty are their mentors, and they work with them to try to deliberately broaden their intellectual horizons. We've actually built a campus that is welcoming for international students and scholars. In fact, we have uh, recently constructed apartments on campus that uh, we reserve for international visitors. In fact, next year we'll have a, uh, a visiting rescue scholar come uh, from Egypt to be with us. So it isn't something that uh, is practiced by three people in an office. It is actually campus-wide and college-wide. And I'd like to ask Nigel to perhaps add to my comments. Um, so um, in terms of the numbers, we, we've just been able to get really strong applications from right across the student body. There is no one type of student that applies for a Fulbright. So uh, the uh, chemistry majors are as likely to apply as the anthropology majors. And so and that's become a part of the student culture. So it's actually become sort of self-sustaining that, that students just, uh, you've got one of them sitting, uh, a, a biology major sitting next to you, that they, they just expect to apply um, um, for Fulbright. So, so that, that Now they do. Uh, in the last few years, uh, I find prospective parents uh, will be contacting <laughs> me. Yeah, we, we want our students to go here because... Um, um, but, but that's something that's sort of grown incrementally and then it's become self-sustaining. The, the other um, point perhaps worth mentioning in terms of the preparation is that in a lot of bigger institutions, uh, um, fellowship advising becomes uh, a staff responsibility. There's an office that deals with this. Um, I wish we could afford lots of staff to do these sorts of things, but it, it, it tends to be faculty have to, to do it. And so this becomes very much uh, a faculty-led initiative and, and there are advantages uh, in, uh, for, for students in, in working with, with their... their um, faculty on this. So that, that's another feature which I think is particular perhaps to, to Pitzer. So. In fact, a, a statistic that I think we showed you in the film and that we often quote is that per thousand we produce the largest number of Fulbrights uh, of any college or university in the country and we've done so now for a decade. Um, that actually came from a conversation that I had with a student and when I welcomed her to campus I asked why did you choose Pitzer and she said well I've crunched the numbers. And statistically speaking, there is no other institution that has a better result for Fulbrights, and I've always wanted one. And I said, that's <laughs> phenomenal. I never, that would not have struck me, but she was absolutely right. Um, Anne Kerr, I see you there in the audience. Yes, I, actually, surprisingly enough, I was going to ask the same question of Laura that was just asked, but since I have the Ask mic, it louder. Uh, 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 louder. <laughs> okay, well, I can ask a couple of questions. One. Uh, uh, following up on this and one following up on the previous question here of Tom. Uh, yes, um, is there an effort to kind of package uh, what Pitzer is doing and a, a recipe and publish it in the Chronicle of, Edu of Education or something like that to kind of spread the word of your success? That's my one question. And second question is, uh, in response to the question about... about um, uh, the, the Asian push or pivot, uh, there was an Islamic initiative, wasn't there, um, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, which did tend to bring more, uh, uh, more Fulbright scholars from, from Muslim sure. countries. Well, well I, I don't mean to, I didn't mean to say there's no coupling and there are very specific programs uh, focused on language and regions, but they are not the only ones where there, there isn't a direct tie to a, 
a goal. Mm -hmm. These would be Democratic, Republican, rest, particularly when there is an openness for Americans to come. So there has, as you know, the, the region very well, there often wasn't the same ease of, of travel and engagement. And we have spent uh, a great deal of effort in those. But then there is equally an effort in Latin America. There's an effort in the Arctic countries. There's efforts in Southeast Asia and things. And, and part of the issue is, uh, again, that these countries are often growing with such uh, speed that building their own infrastructure of higher education, research, engagement, isn't really possible to keep up with the need. And so Fulbright has taken a, a, a desire to help train leaders and university educators and such to shape the infrastructure of education as much as even uh, different research. So there are programs for administrators and, and the rest. So uh, yes, there are specific initiatives and, and at, at very times, but it's um, those ones are happening at the same time others are throughout the world. Um, Mike, and I think we'll make this the last question so we can finish on time. <clears throat> Thank you. I had a question for Laura. So administratively, um, the discussion here has been in large part on academic material and mm -hmm. personal development and growth. So what I wondered was in terms of recruitment, uh, marketing, alumni relations, advancement, and all of those other functions that go on in a college, and also your, your own board, mm -hmm. what impact has all of this had in those functions? Like, for instance, you have a board, how many of your board is non-American? Uh, we actually have now uh, our first trustee from Hong Kong. And we are actively recruiting. We've had other uh, trustees in the past who are not American. And we are also very, very interested in diversifying our board even more when it comes to having international trustees. Um, now, I have to caution you're sitting next to the chair of our board, Robin Kramer. So <laughs> I think she probably has a few thoughts on this. But in, in terms of what has this done for us, uh, I think, um, you know, and I'm kind of coming at it a, at a high level. Um, it has validated our efforts over the last 50 years, that actually the things that we most believe in that are our core values, and we have many of those, uh, are coming to fruition after five decades. And, uh, you know, Pitzer is a very special place. I'm not sure that you can package Pitzer and come up with an instruction manual, because first you have to start with a dedicated group of 11 faculty, a really visionary president who was a poet, uh, and this sense, even from our start, that uh, we are part of the world. Uh, we may have our campus located in Claremont, but we are all world citizens. And um, if you're willing to have that as a core value, if you're willing to hire people who will celebrate that, who are dedicated to principles of diversity and sustainability and intercultural communication, then I think you have a recipe. Uh, but that's a very difficult one to try and implement. It takes a lot of time and a lot of hard work and dedication. And students who are coming to Pitzer College, I think, are looking for, and this is an overly used expression, a value add in their lives. And I think that's very much what we offer at Pitzer College. We are always looking for the meaning in what we do, far beyond our major requirements and minor requirements, but it's the value in what we do and what is most meaningful. Again, as I said, we're a small college, yet every year our students and staff devote over 100,000 hours to community outreach programs. Because again, the point is, is that we want to try and affect, affect the world as positively as we can. Um, we're extremely proud of the Fulbrights who have been members of our community and we really celebrate them. And uh, one of the things that we did last night was we had a panel where we had students uh, and uh, they talked about their experiences as Fulbright Fellows and Nigel moderated it. And it was a global webcast. And um, it was really an important moment to hear about the Pitzer education and what makes it so unique 
from the individuals who actually made their way through it and how that really prepared them from the work that they were doing after the Fulbright program. So in many ways, I think, um, particularly when you look at our earlier years with our uh, emphasis on diversity and international s travel and um, sustainability, we probably were an outlier in those years. And yet, more and more, we see students who want to be part of what we represent. So as of today, uh, we're the eighth most selective liberal arts college in the country and among the most selective 15 colleges or universities in the country. Um, for 250 places in our freshman class, we had over 4,100 applications last year. So we, we obviously are resonating with this generation and I think that Fulbrights are absolutely part of that experience. Tom, you get the last word. Terry, I would, I'd just like to say, um, I certainly came to Pitzer this weekend looking for a recipe, and I don't even cook. Uh, but here's, as, as an outsider, after just two days, but watching this panel talking to students and faculty, I, one thing that I would say seems unique about Pitzer, in addition to all the things that have been said, is even with the competitiveness of the Fulbright program, hearing Paul and hearing the other students last night talk about it, they supported one another. It, it wasn't an individual applying for a Fulbright. You really felt this community spirit of engagement, and it wasn't a zero-sum game of, I win a Fulbright, someone else doesn't. I, I would have thought, you could imagine, in certain colleges where you, know, you almost have a thermometer of what's the goal of number of Fulbrights and how do we get them, and then that almost becomes a zero-sum game. If you get one, I don't. So, that wasn't the attitude here at all. And I do think it's about the whole culture of engagement with the community, both locally and globally. And Paul, maybe you can tell us if, if I'm crazy about this, but it really just seemed that it was part of a sense of we're all engaging with the world and Fulbright's one tool uh, and not being on your own to apply for it. I thought that was a lesson that we could use throughout the program. In, in strengthening it, looking at uh, students working together on that rather than individually. So that's absolutely true because uh, even now I still get uh, emails from you know students I never met asking me, oh, what, what do you need to do to get this Fulbright? And I said, just be yourself and you know attend uh, Professor Boyle's uh, class. <laughs> <laughs> Well, on that note, let me um, thank the State Department staffers who made this possible, uh, Tom Healy and the Fulbright Board, <coughs> Laura Tremblay, Nigel Boyle, and Melanie Lacey from Pitzer, who did so much to, to set this whole lunch up, uh, Paul Kim, their alum, for talking to us, from me, Terry McCarthy of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council, my chairman, John Hotchkiss. I have two other board members here, Don Vinson um, and Andrew Tabacoli, and we have Mike Water, who's on our international circle. Thank you so much all for coming, and have a good day.